Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at yet another Z390 motherboard from Gigabyte. Um, and the brush does indeed work. The Z390 Aorus Extreme Board. It is very extreme. It, that includes the price tag of $550. Um, and also, it's, it's you know, uh, extended ATX, so that, that's another E. Uh, I guess that's why this is missing an E. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, it is huge, it is expensive, and it still doesn't have a PLX chip. Um, I am actually rather disappointed by that. But it does a lot of, uh, it, it does quite a few things right. Um, it's just like, I don't know. It used to be that like a staple feature of these ridiculously expensive flagship motherboards for mainstream Intel CPUs on like say Z77, Z87, Z97, like a staple feature was that you got a PLX chip. So you actually had some 32 PCIe lanes that you could, uh, you know, hook up stuff to. Now, admittedly, they didn't have 32 PCIe lanes worth of bandwidth because the CPU still only has 16 lanes. Um, but you did, like, you could reallocate those 16 lanes between, uh, among more devices more, more conveniently. Though I guess with the fact that, like, NVIDIA has straight up killed uh, four-way SLI and uh, really multi-GPU supporting just multi-GPU su support just getting steadily worse and worse, uh, it does kind of make sense that, you know, no, nobody's really bothering with the PLX chip, and the PCH from Intel does have a lot of PCIe lanes. The thing is, this does only have a 4x connection to the to the CPU, right? So that that's effectively like a PCIe 3.0 4x connection between the PCH and the CPU. So it is theoretically possible to just max out that connection between the CPU and the PCH and then you'd have like a, a bandwidth bottleneck where a PLX chip would avoid that and you could just hang a whole bunch of, P, uh, P, you know, PCIe devices off of, off of the PLX chip. Um, and as long as you, as long as you didn't try to use too many of them at the same time, you wouldn't hit that bottleneck. And ultimately the PLX chip would be, you know, switching your 32 lanes into 16 from the CPU. So you'd hit that bottleneck later than on the 4X connection of the chipset. But yeah, so, you know, and it's just, I think it's kind of sad. I get that the PLX chips are ridiculously expensive. They're not really that useful now that, you know, four-way GPUs and three-way GPUs straight up do not work. But, um, I don't know, with, you know, with Z390, which is like, the, the 9900K, it's an 8-core, it has hyper-threading, it has a lot of multi-threaded performance, um, it's kind of, you know, this is starting to enter sort of workstation territory, and I think a lot of workstation users would appreciate having more PCIe lanes, or at least more flexible allocation of PCIe lanes on the CPU. Because you really, like that's the thing with the PLX chips, you don't actually get more lanes, you just get much more flexibility out of the 16 that you do have. So you can hook up like, you could have multiple devices that each needs an 8x connection, and it would work fine until you tried to run each of those devices at the same time. But anyway, so Gigabyte has opted to not include that, same as the, the, the you know, the... Z390 Godlike from MSI, except Gigabyte has made some better choices in other places here. So you do get the Aquantia 10 gig LAN on this. Um, you do get the same, like very, very well, yeah, pretty much the same vCore VRM, except Gigabyte has actually not scrapped the iGPU VRM. So that that massive block over there is vCore and you still have iGPU power. Um, and this is something that MSI, you know, on their ridiculously expensive godlike, they were like, oh, you know what? Two phases for iGPU power, that's an expense we can cut, can't we? Um, I mean, it is kind of like, I'm not sure how many people are gonna use the iGPU, but it just kind of seems, you know, the board's $550, it should kind of do everything at that point. Um, so axing the, I, so, you know, I like, I'm a fan of Gigabyte not cutting off the iGPU here just on the basis that, like, it this this is two phases. It doesn't make that much difference. Um, so you do have the iGPU power up there. Uh, you also have the various linear regulators for your extreme overclocking down here. So there's a couple low, uh, I think these are LDOs from Rich Tech as usual for Gigabyte. Um, and those are basically there for your cold bug and cold boot bug removal. Um, so they're going to give you voltage control for things like DMI, VCC VTT, PLL, uh, VCC PLL underscore OC, VCC PLL, 
uh, and there's one more, I think. Oh yeah, VCC, you need to do something with VCCIO, and the, like, basically, these are necessary for extreme overclockers, so it's nice that Gigabyte includes them. Realistically, I don't think any extreme overclockers are gonna actually run this board, but it's $550, and these are LDOs. They, they cost, like, single, you know, single dollar, like, less than a dollar, quite possibly, per chip. There is no reason for a motherboard of this price to have, like, for a flagship motherboard to not include them, as far as I'm concerned. So we do have those. We also have VCCIO and VCCSA here. Um, so they're, they're split like that. And I think the top one is going to be SA. The bottom one is VCCIO. Um, what else do we have? G oh, yeah. And in terms of actual overclocking features, Gigabyte has gone for the full loadout. The button you should never use. You get a power button, reset switch, clear CMOS button. Uh, you get a right, a right angled 24 pin, which is kind of interesting. And honestly, with how extended this motherboard is, this is going to be awkward in some cases. Like, I can already see a lot of cases where this is just not going to work. So that is, that is an interesting decision. But yeah, like if you have a big enough case, you know, which you should, because this motherboard is huge, as you can clearly see, it is way past where ATX normally ends. Um... This shouldn't be a problem, but in smaller cases, this could be because then your 24 pin can, yeah, like, I can't even draw where it ends. Uh, so, that, uh, you do get the right angle 24 pin. You also get a 6 pin power uh, for your extra power for the PCIe slots. I do not think that's all that useful considering you can't stick, like, you can't stick four GPUs in this motherboard anyway. And the four, like, if you did, like, you can actually run three-way crossfire off of this. I've done it. It doesn't, uh, it's not a great idea, but it does work. Um, the issue is this is running off of the PCH. So that is a really inadvisable configuration. Um... So this doesn't really serve any practical purpose because normally that power connector is there to take load off of the 24 pin because the 24 pin only has two 12 volt lines in it. And those two 12 volt lines power literally everything on the motherboard. That isn't the V-Core VRM because the V-Core VRM and well, really all of the high power VRMs are going to be hanging off of the, the A pin power connectors up in the top. And we will get to those. So, you know, like th this is there to, to provide extra power to very high power consumption PCIe devices, but... Without a PLX chip, um, I, I don't see the why you would stick a whole bunch of really high power consumption PCIe devices into this. They're probably going to run out of PCIe lanes before you you know you need the extra power connector. So that is uh, you know, but it, it doesn't hurt anything by existing. Um, there's also a socketed BIOS chip right above that. So that's kind of neat. We also have two actual uh, LEDs here indicating which BIOS chip is being used on this motherboard because in typical Gigabyte fashion, this board does have dual BIOS and this one doesn't just have the software implementation. You have the BIOS switch and the BIOS mode switch. So this allows you to put the motherboard between software and hardware BIOS, uh, like dual versus single BIOS mode. Um, and this switch allows you to choose between the main and the backup BIOS, as you can clearly see up here. So basically, if you want to, uh, well, normally the way the, the dual BIOS on Gigabyte motherboards works is if the motherboard starts having trouble posting or something, the, it'll automatically use the backup BIOS to recover. Um, but if you don't want that functionality to work, you can just flick this switch and put the board in single BIOS mode. And at that point, you can choose which BIOS chip is being used using this switch over here. So... I really like this, that, that Gigabyte does have this option because there are some other dual BIOS boards now, now coming out where they just have software dual BIOS and it's just like, I, I don't trust the software to actually work because automatically detecting various boot errors doesn't go nearly, like it doesn't always go as well as you'd hope it would, um, especially considering that it seems like a simple issue. So we do have the BIOS control switches, which I'm a fan of. We also have the OC panel connector. So Gigabyte has their own little OC panel. Um, they don't sell it at retail. I'm actually pretty sure that if you don't work at Gigabyte, you've never seen one of these. <laughs> because, um, yeah, they, they don't sell it as far as I'm aware. It doesn't come with any boards as far as I'm aware. It might come with this one, um, but I don't think it does. But they do have the OC control panel connector here and basically what that does is it gives you um it gives you ratio up down 
uh, power reset and a bun bunch of voltage read points. So it basically adds all of the sort of extreme overclocking buttons that Gigabyte used to cram. Like I really like the Gigabyte boards that would just cram this entire area of the board with buttons for changing your BCLK and your ra CPU ratio and all of that. Well, that is now its own little, you know, own little accessory and it connects to that connector, except they don't sell that accessory. So I don't know how you're ever gonna get your hands on it, but the connector is on the board. So that's, I, I wish they sold it. I think it's an awesome little accessory. I have a, I have a board here that would work with it and I, I don't have the connector. I should ask Gigabyte if they, they still make those and if I could have one. <laughs> anyway, we do also have a postcode of course for troubleshooting. There's also troubleshooting LEDs down here. Um, they are made completely redundant by the postcode. Though I'm not a fan of where the postcode is on the basis that if you do for some reason decide to put something onto the chipset, you know, onto that chipset PCIe slot, you're not going to see it because it's going to get covered up. So, um, this this is a bad place to put the postcode. I kind of feel like if you didn't have this silly, you know, XMP thing here, you could have crammed the postcode right there and that would have been much better as far as positioning goes, but... Hey, it's, you know, like, at least there is a postcode, and admittedly most people really won't run into the issue of actually having anything in this PCIe slot, because that is literally just 4x off of the chipset, so that PCIe slot is just like, like, putting things on that PCIe slot is just a bad idea, They're, <laughs> unless, uh, maybe like a sound card, but who, who even gets those these days? I guess maybe Wi-Fi, except the board has its own Wi-Fi, it comes with its own Wi-Fi adapter as well. So maybe like a network card, you know, you, you could put that on there, but you also have 1x slots for those. So yeah, it's just probably not going to be an issue for most people, but it's still just, I, I think there would have been a better place to, to put that. Um, what else do we have? I think that covers everything. Oh yeah, 10 gig LAN we've covered, and now the 8-pin power connector. So the board does have dual 8-pins because it's a high-end you know, Z390 motherboard, and how do we make a motherboard look more premium? We put more power connectors on it. Uh, honestly, if, like, uh, unless you're messing around with some kind of exotic cooling setup, like D-lidded CPU with liquid, like 9900K with a D-lid, um, and liquid metal, possibly sanded down die, uh, cell ambient cooling, I am not sure how on earth you're going to be able, like, you won't be able to max out that single 8-pin. If you just run a 9900K, no matter how big your water cooling loop is, the, the thermal transfer from the die to the IHS is just not good enough to push much more, like to run the CPU on much more than sort of thir sort of around 300 watts of, of power. Now, admittedly, you can push more than that into it, but again, you're going to be thermal limited before you're going to be uh, limited by the power capability of that power connector there. So you don't need to worry about plugging both of them in. Um, unless you're doing like extreme overclocking or something, you know, like unless you're sub-zero and uh, then it might be advisable to plug in both of them. It is also worth noting that there is no harm in plug in plugging in both of them if you can, but definitely it's not like, like if your power supply doesn't support the extra 8-pin, just don't worry about it. Though I do have to wonder what power supply you're running with your $550 motherboard that doesn't, you know, have an extra 8-pin power connector. But anyway, um, that kind of covers all of the sort of minor features around the board that I care about highlighting. Um, it is loaded with features. The, the only thing that, like, honestly, the only thing I feel like is missing here is the PLX chip. But other than that, this is, the, 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 this is everything it needs to be. Um, now then, let's take a look at the vCore VRM. And the vCore VRM is ridiculous, because of course it is. And if you've seen my Z390, I did a bre PCB breakdown of the Z390 Godlike from MSI for Gamers Nexus. That's this, like, it's the same componentry used for that, for that VRM. So we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11... 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 phase. Um, this is incidentally not the highest phase count of a vCore VRM that Gigabyte has ever produced, but it is a lot and it is massive overkill. Um, in fact, when especially once you realize what these chips are, 
Um, so what are those chips? Well, those are Infineon TDA. I just realized this image doesn't have quite as many pixels as I'm used to. TDA21462. This is a 60 amp power stage. And this is one of those new 60, you know, new generation of power stages. These things are insanely efficient. And with 16 of them, I actually asked Gigabyte about this, is like, does this motherboard even need a heatsink? The answer to that question is no. No, it doesn't. And in fact, there's a video from one of the engineers at Gigabyte of, uh, th like, he took thermal camera images of this VRM after running Prime95 AVX on it for 24 hours with no VRM heatsink, CPU at 5.2 gigahertz, CPU completely thermal, like the the, the board, Gigabyte boards allow you to change the, the, the TJ Maxx, or, well, not the TJ Maxx, but the, temp throttle, uh, the throttle point of your CPU. CPU is going well over 100 degrees because it's uncoolable at that point. Um, and, you know, the, the board's just kind of sitting there at like 75 to 80 degrees on the VRM with no heatsink and no airflow either. It's just sort of sitting on a desk and it's just like, I mean, that's, that's what I expected, but damn, <laughs> like this VRM is insane. Um, and the same is true, like on the Z390 Godlike, except here, you know, Gigabyte, like, because the reason, the reason why MSI scrapped the IGPU VRM is in order to get these 16 phases, um, you need to completely max out the IR35201, which is, of course, this chip right here. So that's, that's our favorite IR35201 voltage controller. And uh, it's running in 8 plus 0 phase mode, um, which is why I'm saying it's completely maxed out. And this is a problem because, like, okay, so how do we power the IGPU? Well, you'd buy another voltage controller. And this is why, you know, eight, true eight phases is relatively unpopular because this chip doesn't go past eight phases. So if you run out of phases on this chip, you're buying another chip, you know, and that's more board space as well as just more parts that you're going to have to put on the board. So that's a rather expensive thing to do to max out your 35201's phase, phase capabilities. So, but Gigabyte doesn't care. This board's $550. It should do everything. So here comes the IR3520, what I assume is a 35204, because that's what they've done before. Um, and this chip only goes up to like three plus one phases uh, max, but here it's running two plus zero. So that's pre pretty normal, right? And that takes care of the iGPU. And that is running through an IR3598 on the back of the board. So, um, and it's running in dual driver mode. So you do actually have a you know, two-phase iGPU power here. So if you want to run like uh, Intel QuickSync or whatever it is, that so there's some kind of iGPU acceleration thing that Intel has that is like good, apparently. Well, if you want to run that, this board supports that because Gigabyte went out of their way to make sure that they can still power the iGPU after they used all of the phases from the 35201. Um, so that's pretty... That's a pretty good idea, you know? When your board costs this much, it better do everything. Um, 3598 dual driver there. And, uh, the MOSFETs for that are, of course, the, the like, they're, they're not great, but, you know, they're adequate for the application. These actually do need the heatsink. Um, these don't. But those are the 4C, uh, 10Ns that we're completely used to from Gigabyte at this point, and 4C06s. And it should be more than plenty to power the iGPU. Um, it's just, like, the, these aren't exactly super efficient or anything, but... I'm not sure that you're going to be over, like, I don't think anybody overclocks the iGPU anyway, and I'm not sure it even clocks that, high, like, that that it's worth doing either. So, yeah, but iGPU power is taken care of, so it will at least run the iGPU on, like, some other motherboards. So then, um, how do we get the 35201 in 8 plus 0 phase mode to run 16? Well, the, of course, our favorite dumb doubler... Uh, <laughs> The IR3599, it's uh, like, it, it can also quadruple. It, it can also quadruple, and Gigabyte has actually used that functionality in the past. They, they built a mo motherboard with 32 phases at one point, um, which was silly. But <laughs> anyway, um, here it's just running into, you know, into phase doubler mode. So basically the 3599 takes a PWM signal from the 35201 and trades it between two power stages. Um, 
So the thing is, it doesn't do any current balancing or any kind of advanced power management. But honestly, on a VRM like this, that doesn't really matter. In fact, uh, when I was doing my VRM efficiency calculations, I ran into the very funny issue that uh, power stage efficiency curves normally look something like, where, where's some space? Here we have some space. So if you look at power stage efficiency curves, they typically look something like this. Or, no, like that. Okay? And the thing is, um, this VRM, for like the lower current outputs, mo like actually not even the lower current outputs, like up until sort of 200 amps, you're going to be staying sort of in this range with if you have like all 16 phases running at the same time. So this board should not be running most of the VRM most of the time because it's going to be really like it's not efficient to have like less than 10 amps through one of these power stages is really not an efficient way to run things. On the flip side, it still wouldn't need a heatsink, but it's just, yeah, like for maximum efficiency, um, we're, we're going to be looking at these kinds of, let's go through the efficiency figures at this point, uh, these kinds of numbers. So 400 kilohertz switching frequency for these, uh, 1.3 volts output. And I did actually, this time around, I did uh, did manage to get more information on the TDA 21462s the, There's no public data sheet for these, but I did get uh, more info on those. So in fact, like the the video I did for, uh, for Gamers Nexus with the Z390 Godlike, um, the power efficiency figures there are wrong because I was going off of a pre, like a previous generation 3575 power stage instead of what these actually are. And these are insanely efficient. Like it, it blows my mind how, how low heat output these get once you're at the really high current outputs. So anyway, so all of the current, like the, all of the efficiency figure is here apply to the MSI Godlike as well, but the Godlike is $50 more and doesn't have things like the 10 gig LAN um, or an IGPU VRM, which I don't like, I, I just find that kind of ridiculous. Anyway, so at our usual low current value of 150 amps output for the vCore VRM, um, for ideal efficiency, you're going to be looking at about 12 watts of heat output on the entire VRM on eight phase mode. If it actually ran in 16 phase mode, you'd be looking more at like 15. Um, in uh, more at like 15 watts of heat output. Now, 200 amps output, um, 12 phase mode, because Again, this just has way too many of these power stages. Um, you'd be looking at about 16 watts of heat. Um, if you ran it at six, uh, if it was running 16 phase mode, it would be slightly less efficient than at that. Now at 250 amps output, the VRM can finally run all 16 phases, but at this point you're like, good luck cooling that on like, no way. You're not cooling that. Yeah, at that point, you're looking at voltages in the range of, say, 1.45 volts or higher, which is just completely uncoolable on a 9900K. Um, so 16 phase mode at that point, you're going to be looking at about 20 watts of heat output, which is like nothing, like absolutely nothing. Um, and it just keeps getting sort of better, you know, 300 amps output. I mean, it doesn't literally keep getting better, but the efficiency, like at this point, we've hit that sweet spot of the efficiency curve where it's just ridiculous for a very long period of time before it starts falling off. Um, so 300 amps output, you're going to be looking at about 24 watts of heat, which like, th th this still won't need a heat sink. <laughs> like that's less than a watt, like... There's 16 freaking power stages here. They're going to be producing less than two watts per chip. Um, like, you, you don't, like, the, the, this board really, really doesn't need the VRM heatsink it comes with. Um, 350 amps output. You're going to be looking at about 28 watts of heat. Um, which, just, like, this just looks wrong to me. Um, 350, like like less than one tenth of the current output is heat, which is crazy efficient. And then, which incidentally, these, these power stages have like a peak efficiency of like 95.5% at like uh, 20, around 20 amps output. So yeah, I mean, the efficiency figures line up, but they're still just absolutely crazy. Because in the past, say the 3575, which was like a top of the line, you know, 60 amp power stage, that thing maxes out at around sort of, 93 
you know, 93, 94% efficiency, you know? So um, the, the figures for these are a lot more impressive. And then 400 amps output, because like we, we could keep going for like ages and ages and ages, because obviously we're nowhere near the theoretical maximum for this, but we're just gonna stop at 400 amps because it doesn't make sense to go any higher. 400 amps, you're gonna be looking at about 34 watts of heat. Um, I mean, you know, there, there's two boards with this VRM, and that's this board and the Z390 Godlike from MSI. This VRM is absolutely ridiculous. Like, it, the, yeah, like <laughs> this wouldn't, this, this would be great on like X299. Th that, that would be like the ideal place for this, this to be low. Like that, that's where this VRM would fit well. Um, here it's just kind of showing off really. Um, but, and it's also really, really expensive actually, because the TDA21462 as of right now is about $2.9 per chip. Um, if you're buying them bulk, so you're looking at sort of, uh, you know, $46 US for just the power stages in this VRM. So very, very expensive to do this. Um, but, you know, it's a $550 motherboard. I think <laughs> at that point, it's like, yeah, sure, do it. It's fine. No, like doesn't matter. Uh, at that point, it's completely acceptable to do that kind of thing. Now, VCCSA and VCCIO are much more uh, reasonable sized, let's put it that way. As in, they're a single phase each. Um, they use our favorite gigabyte, well, gigabyte's favorite um, 4C06N reduced packaged MOSFET, uh, reduced package, no, that's 60, not C06N. And that's the reduced package sized variant, uh, reduced package size variant. Um, so slightly better electric, like better electrical char characteristics than the 4C06N up here. Much, much worse thermal char characteristics because they're tiny. Um, they are completely adequate for the application of powering the system agent and the IO. That's really not a problem whatsoever. Each of them is a phase. Um, so, you know, they're actual buck converters here. And uh, interestingly enough, Gigabyte has an input filter for each separately. Um, and the voltage controller for those is an RT80, RT8120 from Richtech Semiconductor. So, well, I, actually, I don't think Richtech has semiconductor as part of their name. It's just Richtech. So that, that's just a Richtech single phase buck controller. And uh, yeah, this is a pretty standard setup for most gigabyte motherboards. I think actually, yeah, this is like they, they have this VRM on like the master, the pro, the Ultra, I think even the Elite. Um, really, this is sort of the gigabyte standard for VCCSA and VCCIO, so no surprises there. Um, but, you know, still very like ni nice to see that. And uh, moving on, we have memory, you know, DDR4 power, single phase again. And uh, same situation, I think, with... Uh, I'm, actually, I'm not sure what chip they're using here. It's probably another RT8120 uh, uh, just because that's pretty like, it doesn't make sense to use a different single phase buck converter. Now this is something where like say ASRock or Asus kind of on paper has an advantage because they do go for like two phase memory power generally. Uh, in practice, I've not really noticed that making a difference. Um, really what makes a big difference in memory overclocking is the actual trace layout. And I think for this motherboard, Gigabyte is still, Gigabyte is going with T-topology, just judging based on the fact that reading the motherboard manual, it sounds like you can, like reading the motherboard manual, they don't really make a distinction between like preferred memory slots. So basically if you're running two memory sticks on this motherboard, you can install them in like this slot and this slot and it's fine. Or you can install them in this slot and this slot and it's still fine. And it like shouldn't make a difference. And uh, judging from the Z370 Gaming 7 that they sent me a while ago, uh, which I have messed around with some more, um, that board actually reflects that where it will boot the exact same memory settings regardless of which combination of memory slots you use. So that's, uh, yeah, and the, like, the, so that's a T-topology memory setup. And the thing is, uh, it's better for high memory quantity. Like if you have a ton of RAM, it works better because uh, the the memory sticks are all length matched. And so the there there's no, like it doesn't get worse as you add memory sticks. 
uh, well, it does because you have extra load on the memory controller, but it doesn't like have worse signal integrity depending on how much how many memory sticks you install. However, on the flip side, if you do only run two memory sticks, it tends to clock worse than if you have flyby uh, or da or daisy chain uh, topology, which is the other type where basically there's a favored memory slot. So it would be like the it, it goes to one memory slot first and then it goes to the second one instead of equal length to all memory slots. So, yeah. Um, ultimately, I think... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense that they opted for the for the layout that, you know, favors the, well, favors running a ton of RAM, especially for this motherboard, because this really is kind of like, I think they're kind of aiming for workstations. Um, I still think as a workstation board, it really should have a bloody, P like it should have the PLX chip. But uh, yeah, um, so it's not going to be the king of memory overclocking, but, uh, you know. That's that's kind of that. The memory power, though, is not really going to be playing a role in that. It's a... And for that, we're looking at a 4C06N um, high-side MOSFET. And the reason why, like, normal... Like, here, you actually have a different high-side MOSFET because you need slightly better efficiency. Here, they're just, like... Um, here, like, the, since DDR4 is so low power, it doesn't matter that this thing takes a month to switch on and off. Um, and then, of course, we have two 4C06Ns for the low side. So that's your two low sides in parallel. And that's yet more 4C06Ns. So that's a pretty standard uh, ATX motherboard memory power for Gigabyte. Like, this is a layout they use, a, well, a VRM that they use a lot. So, yeah, um, that is the Z390 Aorus Extreme. It's $550, so really expensive. Um, but as far as the VRM goes, there's only one motherboard that kind of, like, there's only one other motherboard with a VRM on par with this, and that's the Z390 Godlike from MSI. And the Godlike costs more money, and the Godlike doesn't have an iGPU VRM, and it doesn't have, uh, the, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't seem to have the linear regulators for your extreme overclocking voltages, it doesn't have 10 gig LAN, um, it has the six, like this six pin power connector, which is equally useless on both motherboards in my opinion, but on the Godlike, they put it in the middle of the board and that's just a stupid place to put it. And I think at $600, you know, you'd expect some, something a little like a better designed, you know, better thought out design for where that power connector is. And Gigabyte knows that like putting it here is just silly. Um, this also has the dual BIOS, which is standard for Gigabyte motherboards, which I think MSI has that on the Godlike as well, but um, you know, that's really a minor distinction. So, yeah. Um, do I think this is worth $550? I don't think this is a very, well, I don't think this is a very practical motherboard. Um, it is very impressive. It's also just really expensive and, uh, you know, if, if you really want the 10 gig LAN, there's other, like, there's cheaper options. Obviously, you are going to be giving up a lot of VRM capability there. Um, I'm not sure, because, again, like, there's two, like, there's two motherboards with this VRM, and nobody's going to beat it, as far as I'm aware. Uh, so, yeah, it's kind of a, kind of a weird situation, like, I don't know. It's like, I guess if you want the best possible VRM with 10 gig LAN and you also want your quick sync, so like your iGPU working and, and you just kind of want everything, this is about as close as you're going to get to having everything, except a PLX chip. That's still not here. And I really, really think this should have had a PLX chip. Though that would have, like, I'm not sure if that would have actually driven the cost of the motherboard up. Probably it would have because PLX chips are sort of between... Like, m most recently that I checked, they were $100 a piece, which is ridiculous. Um, so that, like, if they just, you know, if that just got tacked onto the price of the board, the board would be $650, and at that point, it's just like, yeah, okay, that's, that doesn't, that's not practical in the slightest, but, um, yeah, as, as it stands, it's just kind of like, um, it's a ridiculous motherboard, it's extreme. It is, it's like, the, the name is very fitting. <laughs> very, very fitting. Um, I, I, like, you know, I, I'm going to leave it up to you to decide if you think 500, like, if this, it, this all makes sense, like, for $550. If this actually makes practical sense to you. I, I can see why it's $550. Like, this isn't cheap to do. 
Um, and so, like, and it, it and it basically has everything, except the you know PLX chip, which I've been ripping on for a while now. But uh, yeah, um, it is still also very very expensive. So yeah, hard, hard to hard to make a call. But as as a flagship motherboard, yeah, sure, th this makes perfect sense. So that is it for the video. Um, you know, G Gigabyte here has the, I mean, there, there's only two boards with this VRM, so I guess the first place, yeah, first place for vCore VRM design, they share it with MSI, um, and, uh, except this is better featured as far as I'm concerned, so, yeah, that, that, that's it, thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, question, suggestions uh, down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon and t-shirts. You can find a link to all of that down in the description below. And uh, what else was there? Right, um, keep in mind that Gigabyte did send the, the motherboard pictures in. They also sent me a 9900K and some uh, motherboards. So yeah, I think I'm pretty sure I did a disclaimer right at the start of the video, but you know, it's, it's been 30 minutes, I might as well remind you. And I'm gonna go hit that stop button now before I accidentally make this video another